There's a classic Rodgers and Hammerstein song from the musical Oklahoma called I Can't Say No. If you remember the story, people tisk tisked about Ado Annie and her behavior. But really, how different are you as a business person? I'm Doug Kaufman with Shop Owner Magazine. Welcome to SOS Shop Owner Solutions. We're exploring some of the nightmares today's shop owners face. We're talking about those 3 a.m. panics, those things that either wake you up or keep you from falling asleep in the first place. And truly, one of the biggest fears is not having enough work to make enough money to pay the bills. This episode is brought to you by Shop Boss, the leading shop management solution for independent auto repair shops. Built by a former shop owner, Shop Boss offers all the cutting edge features and integrations you need to keep your shop on top, from built in DVI and remote payment capabilities to a powerful business reporting dashboard. You can try this cloud based solution free for 30 days. Just visit shopboss.net slash podcast to learn more. You know, we usually have a tendency to want to please people. It's easier to say yes than uh, to turn someone down. Our guest today, A.J. Neely from Neely's Auto Service in Edgewater, Maryland, and Wendy Clausen from Swedish Solutions in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, are experts at customer satisfaction. But that doesn't always mean what we think it means. Also with me is my co-host, Vic Tarasik from Shop Owner Coach, a guy who knows that saying no <laughs> can sometimes be very advantageous to your shop. Yes, yes Vic, I do. Is it true that yes can be negative and no can be positive? Yes or no. <laughs> yes can be negative, especially when it hammers you the wrong way. I have had situations that I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I just get myself into? So, having a repair shop doesn't mean you always say yes. Have you ever wished you declined a certain repair, a customer, or a car? And maybe somebody just wasn't a good fit for you and your team. So we're going to talk to two industry professionals who will guide us through their experience of saying yes and no and some of the stories that go with them. Wendy? Wendy? Welcome, I'm glad you're in the studio with us today. Thank you, Vic, it's good to be here. AJ, appreciate you being here from Edgewater, Maryland, Neely Auto Service. So you guys have both experienced the power of yes, the power of no, so so, sh so I'm gonna go, to, I'm actually gonna, gonna kick it to, to our more remote one, AJ. AJ, tell me, <laughs> when, when do you wish you had said no instead of yes? Well, first off, Vic, I, I wanna uh, just, just say thank you for calling me a professional that uh made me flatter this morning so <laughs> thank you very much but uh <laughs> anyway it's an honor to be here but um let's see you, you know the power of no right um and you it's it's easier to say no the more you experience all the bad yeses that you've had in 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 business and in your industry and i'll think of like the first no that really or the yes that i that i said that really comes to mind that i shouldn't have done and if you think about this you know when you start your auto repair shop you're getting things up and running you you you're attracted to so many different shiny objects that you want to get your hands into uh whether it's body work or selling cars whatever it might be but one of the first things i did when we first moved into this location we had all this space is i said yes to being a penske rental uh no. place yeah. and you know that was like oh man I, I you know a month into it i completely regretted doing it and i, and I gave them the boot two months into it just like just a, another shiny object that was out there wasn't even worth my time so that's just like one of the first things early on when we really started growing that that was a that uh, looking back it that was a complete failure so all teachable moments all growing moments as we're moving forward so you, you have uh uh, uh when you wish you'd said yes to as far as i said yes to I, you know honestly i live my life uh with no regrets there, there, i don't look back and say i wish i should have said yes to that um mm -hmm. that's just my philosophy so there's more uh there's more of those ones that you always remember where you sh i should have said no to you know um that that uh it, it, it's powerful yeah so, Wendy, not all things look like the, the like you want them to look, do they? No, they do not. So, 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 share share a story with us about how and wish you had said no. Um, 
I have lots of them. <laughs> no is a is a really hard word for me, and just so so why is that? Just, um, because it makes me feel like I cannot accomplish it, and can't isn't really in my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I always, no matter what it is, it can be accomplished, and we can do it. You just have to try. You have to work hard enough. So that I feel like a failure every time I say no. Um, just this week, I just had a, um, today, this morning, I had a gentleman who we service his car all the time. He comes in, he needs a alarm module uh, programmed, and we can't do it. And it drives me nuts that we can't do it. <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's, it's Volvo, and it's, you know, it's the way they, the way they are, you have to go to. Um, you have to go to the dealer to do it, but telling him that he couldn't, and, and I know he's going to pay at least twice, if not mm -hmm. three times, what we would have charged him if we had, if we were capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. so. Well, there's a certain skill in in saying no. It's easy <laughs> to say yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, we can do it. And looking at your, you know, looking at your resume, you've said you've said yes to a lot of things, <laughs> and and you've accomplished a lot of things. Obviously, it's uh, it's it's impressive, <laughs> but uh, but there is a skill to say no because what if you lose that customer for more than just this job? Well, I'll go somewhere else. You know, how do you deal with that, AJ? Yeah, so that. that uh, you know, we want to make sure that um, uh, the skill of saying no is we still want to have a solution to the uh, to that that customer's issue. So, for example, an issue where we, we say, "Look, hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. So and So, we, we would love to be able to take care of you. Unfortunately, this is outside of our scope of experience, so we'd love to be able to uh, still still create a solution to your issue." So. We have a great referral for you, X, Y, Z. This person will take great care of you. So in the instance, too, where Wendy, where you mentioned about um, being able to, uh, you know, sending it to the dealership, if you create a relationship with someone in the service department at that dealership, uh, it allows that customer to still have that, that interaction, that relationship that you want. Of course, you want them to come back, but knowing that you still took care of them, even though you had to say no in certain instances like that, it's definitely still a positive. So what you're saying is you're not telling him no. You're telling him not what you can't do. You're, you're telling him what you can do by providing him with a solution. So you're protecting What I'm hearing is you're protecting yourself by not taking on something. You're providing them with a solution. Everybody wins. Yeah, and I love, I, I never thought of that. that. That's fabulous. That is exactly what I'm going to do. So... Next on my list, and I think tomorrow. that I think that's one of the problems that a lot of a lot of shop owners get into is because shop owners by by nature we we have a servant's heart. Mm -hmm. We want to say yes. We want to take care of that customer. We want to create a great experience. And I've done what AJ did, except you know when he said yes to the Penske, I said yes to classic vehicles. And we were going we were, you know we moved into our new building and we drink, get dropped off a 55 chevrolet two corvettes yada 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 next thing you know we've got classic vehicles everywhere and what do classic vehicle customers want to do take a long time getting it fixed yes. <laughs> and what i but here's what i didn't realize is i one i love classic cars but i didn't realize was the message it conveyed to my lady customers classic car work is expensive in their mind and that's all they work on. And so what was happening was, un un unknowingly, the work I said yes to was saying no to that customer that, that showed up with a, with a good paying job <laughs> that was in and out in one day. And when I, I actually had a really good customer of mine tell me, you know, Vic, there's rumors out that you're really expensive. And I'm like, why, Pete? And he pointed out into the shop. That day we started moving every one of them out. And we, we stopped doing classic service at that point. Vic, I'm glad you took that, uh, you, you opened up about that because you put Wendy and AJ on the hot seat and I was going to do the same thing <laughs> to you. You know, as a shop owner, when you were a shop owner, you know, when did you say no and feel successful saying no? There was a, there was a yeah. case where you didn't feel good about saying yes, but, you know, how, how did saying no work for you? Well, it, it came to defining who we were classic vehicle-wise. I would say no to that customer who had a, a car that was just 
too big of a job that you know when I'm talking classic vehicle we had a building you know eventually we had a building we we had out back where we would do the, do that work we keep it out of the eyesight of everybody but some jobs were just weren't, weren't worth it I had to step back and look and go this is the kind of job I need to say no to and move it down to something else I I needed to know the limitations of our shop so I didn't say no I, I was like here's X, you know this this shop will, will handle you and at our shop and, and you guys are probably the same we didn't do body work but we did body work we didn't do transmissions but we did transmission work we didn't do electrical but we did and, it, and we were a full service shop to our customers but we had and what i mean by that all the stuff that we didn't do we would send it out to vendors trusted vendors that we knew we were the touch point for our customers and so I said no to actually doing the work, but said yes to bringing the vehicle in. That's an interesting point where you served as that intermediary with other shops, mm -hmm. um, allowing you to retain the customer and, and, and still make sure the job was done right. Right. Because the customer trusts you. They trust they, you, Wendy. They trust AJ. They, they trusted Vix. And the customer doesn't want to be told no and then go have to find out who's going to do it we've got industry partners right aj you you've got yeah. you you don't do transmissions at neely's do you no just r and r we're not we're not breaking them open no yeah so you are you but but you're, you're full service for for them and so you become mm -hmm. yeah you become that that hub and that's really what a shop owner wants to become and i think that's the problem is not problem what i think it is in the desire to serve their needs, we get into stuff that's not profitable or it exceeds our skill set. Yeah. There's a certain amount of, whether it's experience or knowledge or just comfort, though, knowing what you can say no to. Mm -hmm. You know, when, you know, when is the job too big? When is the job unprofitable? How do you determine that? How does a shop owner know when to say no? Mm -hmm. Well, I had one one employee that you know, he was a two week trial employee, and he came to me, and I had to say, "No, you just don't have the skills." He 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 wanted to be an apprentice. He wanted to come in. He didn't have the skills to push a broom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was a nice guy, genuinely nice guy, and I wanted to help him. You know, and and uh, us who serve, we also want to help people along the way, right? Yeah. And I really wanted to help him and. When I said no, I felt really good about saying no, but a couple months later when I ran into him, he said, yeah, right after that, I was sick and I had this, you know, something burst in the stomach. I'm like, man, am I glad I didn't have you working for me then. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not only necessarily saying no to a job, it could be saying no to a, uh, uh, to a person for whatever reason, you know, and, and you don't want to get stuck with uh, an unpaid bill. You don't want to get stuck with, <laughs> extra equipment that you'll never use again. Mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned uh, some of the projects that you've worked on. Exactly, we had a, um, we, we service probably three Mini Coopers. So we have three customers that have, each have a Mini Cooper. And uh, it was something with the, um, the timing chain, I think it's a chain, and uh, it stretches and there's a, the tool that you need to fix it is very expensive and to, um, pay for that tool, we would have to fix that problem on at least five Mini Coopers. Mm -hmm. So I have, and similar uh, to sending somebody to the dealer, and I never thought about that, but um, I sent them to a shop that exclusively does um, Mini Coopers and Mercedes and BMWs. And I called the guy, told him I was sending one of one of my people to him, and I, and honestly, I figured I would lose him mm -hmm. because he does Mini Coopers. But this, uh, the gentleman that owns the shop that I sent it to, is a great guy, and he sends cars to me when they when he can't figure them out. So we just go back and forth, and I never. It's that doesn't bother me as much as it did sending sending my other customer to the dealer. That bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> so sending it to another shop owner like myself, I'm okay with that because they they reciprocate. So. That's good. So AJ, have you seen shops that say yes all the time? No, oh, there's plenty of them. The the the, the yes shops. Um, 
Yeah, you're digging a hole, right? Uh, I, I, and so back to the examples we've already talked about, uh, Doug, I think you mentioned about uh, the expense and tooling, right? To do certain things, you, you got to figure out. Um, let's just take a, an example right now. Let's just think about uh, AC work, right? We've got this new refrigerant out, that's out there, the 1234YF. You know, initially, there wasn't enough work to make any sense at all to make the investment to do that. But um, it, it, so as a result, it's, it's, you have to outsource that or you have to, to send them somewhere else, unfortunately, as a result of that. But when you when you start tracking that, seeing how uh, popular it's getting, then you make the investment on the tooling. So, you know, uh, Wendy, that, that could be an example in the future is if, if you're getting more of those Mini Coopers potentially and maybe the investment of that tool is is worth it at some point. But back to saying yes to everything, you know, for example, just because you you have a car that tows a trailer doesn't mean i'm going to work on your trailer you know just because we do state inspections that with our uh credentials allows us to also inspect trailers we're not going to do that you know there's there's definitely red lines that we have the non-negotiables um you know the the big thing is the the no customer supply parts you know a lot of people will just say hey you know just bring it in bring it 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 breaks the chain uh of, of service for our our business right you know we we provide you know we diagnose it uh we provide the parts we provide the service and we also protect you with a great warranty on the back end of that if you start breaking that circle with you know bringing in your own parts or wanting it to do it a certain way um or having someone else diagnose it and then we work on it we're just we're just going to say no to that of course we're not just going to say a hard no get out we don't want to see you again we're we're just going to, we have to educate, you know, it's really at the end of the day, this is what we have to do for our customers to educate as to why it's a no. And I think they'll begin to appreciate the value that we're bringing them. So what would you say to a shop owner who's listening to you and says, well, I let my customer bring their own parts in, but I just increased my labor rate. What would you say to him? And that's, that's totally fine. That's perfectly fine. I can tell you the reason that we have no's, like I mentioned earlier, is that they've been teachable moments. Right. We've said yes to those customers and we've had experiences where it's just, you know what, doesn't make any of us look good. Doesn't It's a lose-lose for customer and the shop. So we just, it, it's just, it's our personal business decision. Now there's nothing wrong, I, I agree. You can make up for the lost, uh, lost profit on parts by raising, raising your labor rate. That's no problem at all. If you've got great experience with it, um, and, and you're picky and it's the right customer, go for it. But for us in this situation, we just haven't been happy with that experience. So well, Vic, I was going to ask you, what could possibly go wrong? Oh, nothing could go wrong. If you have customer supply parts. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It always goes well. It's like being on flyer beds of ease. And I lie really well. Mm -hmm. Nothing could go wrong. Well, so let's, let's talk about my biggest horror story with customer supply parts. I had a customer bring a 1958 Corvette in, have an engine rebuilt, and he said, Vic, I've got this dual quad manifold that was built specifically for that car in 1958. Would you install it? He had it completely redone, looked beautiful. I'm like, okay, great. Installed it. Now fast forward all the way through. We installed it after the vehicle, after, after the engine got rebuilt, took it on a test drive, and the car caught on fire. Yeah, and this was a 1958 Corvette show car. Oh, no. So, got the car put out. There was $30,000 worth of damage. Uh, insurance company got involved, of course. Mm -hmm. Insurance company investigated. They came back at us, and they asked me some questions about customer-supplied parts. And they're like, they asked me, they said, do you have a policy for installing customer-supplied parts? I go, well, I don't have a policy. And they're like, well... Here's the thing, and this is a big insurance company. It's one that insures mostly repair shops. They said, if you install another customer supplied part, we will drop you. Can any of us as shop owners afford to be without insurance? No. You know, that was one I said yes. I mean, he was a really good customer, and I said yes to Sal. And man, that was, but well, I got a lot of mileage out of the story, that's for darn sure. <laughs> Uh, you know, but I, I want to share that story with shop owners because they need to see, does their insurance cover them if they install a customer supply, supply part? And see, AJ also brought up another point, you break the chain. So when that, that part gets manufactured, 
from the time it gets it leaves the manufacturer all the way down through every hand that touches it there is implied and in, in insurance protection so if something happened at a, a part that i put on at my shop there's going to be legal battles to go all the way through and the, cu- the, the, the customer will get you know made whole but everyone along the chain from the manufacturer all the way down to the distribution and installation will be the ones that will participate equally whereas if i install a customer supplied part now who's on the hook for the liability side of it i am solely will my limits cover it will i even be insured for it there's more, maybe more there's more questions that than answers right now for shop owners that are listening but the biggest question I'm, I have for them is, are you covered? And have you asked your insurance company, will they, will you cover me if I install a customer supplied part? That should be a question they should ask. Wendy, you don't want your staff to just randomly say, no, nah, I don't want to work on that project. <laughs> but you also don't want them to necessarily come to you about everything. Should we do this? Should we do this? Should we do this? You want them to have a... Uh, 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 certainly a feeling of ownership when it comes to those decisions. How difficult is it to train your team to be able to say no? I mean, if it's hard for you to say no yourself. Yeah, um, it's, you know, I've, I inherited, inherited this shop and they all came very well trained. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I'm very, I really don't have to worry about that very much. They're, they are more training me than I am training <laughs> them. Um, the uh, explaining to, we used to, when, um, when my husband owned the shop, we used to, um, he used to, certain customers would put on parts like that, <laughs> or customer supplied parts. And um, I would always, why are you doing that? You're not making any money. Do you know you're you're hurting yourself? And finally, and that was before I was even in the business. And um, fine, when I took over and started running things, I told, I just told them I said no. I said this we have a reputation, and our reputation is huge. People like us; they come to us. And um, I mean. I have people that come from Canton to Cleveland to work on their cars. So they're not, I don't, uh, I always make sure that it's the right part, it's the original, the manufacturer's part, and we do, and that's the way we do it. And we're a little bit more expensive, but I, all my customers will tell you, they can drive down the road and they're not worried. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, your customers may be great people, but they don't necessarily know how to pick the right part. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. going on Googling and then going to grab it on Amazon That's is it. just not. Yeah. Just well, they look the same. Those those engine <laughs> valves look the same. Those uh, brake rotors yeah, look you, the same. We, we call them YouTube certified technicians. So. <laughs> YouTube certified technicians. That's right. This episode of Shop Owner Solution is brought to you by Shop Boss, the leading shop management solution for independent auto repair shops. Built by a former shop owner, Shop Boss offers all the cutting edge features and integrations you need to keep your shop on top. From built in DVI and remote payment capabilities to a powerful business reporting dashboard. Try this cloud based solution free for 30 days. Visit shopboss.net slash podcast to learn more. Vic, again, Help us figure out when no is yes and yes is no. When no is yes. Well, saying no allows you to open the door to a more profitable job. I'll, I'll give you an example. You have a customer come in, and they may only want to buy the minimum amount. Our job is to ensure a customer's vehicle is safe. It is well taken care of. And if all they want is the oil change that day and maybe whatever that's going to take, you know, an hour or two is worth of labor. Or they're just, a, a, honestly, a challenge to deal with. And you, you realize the customer is going to be a time suck. So you just, you know what, we really prefer not to do the work. Or you price, I, I, one of the strategy I used was to overprice a particular job. And that was a nice way of saying no. And right behind them would be a customer that would, approve everything and was great to deal with and it was a valued long-term customer I had to take time and trade my advisors to not always say yes to every person that came through the door and not to prejudge either 
because you know you prejudge somebody by the way they look you're going to totally miss the mark and what i wanted them to do was know who to say yes to and who to say no to because their propensity was to say yes to everybody that walked through the door and then when a customer came in we were full we couldn't get the job in they went someplace else and we lost a great customer and i trained them to the fact that while it's okay to say no to that customer and not take that job in because right behind them is going to be somebody who is looking to buy what we sell because not every customer is our customer right right and you know aj do you want everybody in edgewater maryland Yes. You want everybody. Yes, I do. And, and <laughs> I want everyone. I want, bring it. Uh, but, but you know, not to backfire this whole conversation about nope. no, but, uh, you know, it, it's uh, – let's take that as an example then. That should be another teaching moment to where do we have a scheduling issue? Is there a reason that they need to drop it off now? Is it an emergency that the car is disabled and needs to go – you know, it needs to get worked on? I, I, we've got a fleet of loaner cars. We've got four of them in the parking lot. Those are great tools to use in your toolbox to get someone a set of wheels, to extend some time that you can get a job done. Uh, if someone needs a ride to work, of course, shuttle service. I mean, this is, you know, 21st century. We're all doing this kind of stuff. But look, being able to identify and implement some of those objections that you might get so we're even in, internally, if you're, if you're looking at your business and saying, man, I wish I could get that. Are you understaffed? Do you not have a set of wheels for that customer? Can you not give them a ride? Um, it's always looking for those opportunities to see well, where, where, where can, where's the bottleneck and what can we do to fix it? It's just a great point that the decision needs to be on a case-by-case -case basis, really. And it's not even a customer-by-customer -customer basis. It's a case-by-case -case basis because the same customer, you may say no to them for this job, but yes to them for this job, or have a solution when it comes to we can't get you in now but we do have a rental car or a loaner car that we can offer to you for a few days before we get to the job. Uh, you know, there's a, over the past 15 months, it's probably been some concern about, you know, are we going to have business? Are we, you know, should we take everything just because we don't know what's going to happen? There's, there's, you know, how do you get through that uncertainty? Yeah, that's the, um, the during, during this past 15 months, um, a lot of companies were talking about, you know, COVID surcharges, um, adding, uh, charging, charging customers the credit card fees instead of the, our, our processing fees instead of that. And when it gets down to it and there aren't any cars in the door and you're trying to figure out how to save some money, it becomes really tempting. And it really is just, uh, that's all you, you're like, well, maybe if I just a little bit here or a little bit there. And it, you really have to go back to figure out what your shop is about and what you're about. And once you figure out that, where your values are, then you you start to say no to things like that. You know, I would, I, I don't, I believe that um, my credit card processing fees are a cost for me to run my business, not for my customers to come see me. So I'm, um, and same with COVID surcharges. You know, stuff like that is just it's part of my job. You know, it's it's part of how I service the community, and and I um, I would I just would never do that. That's a big no. <laughs> so there are business things that you would say no to, not necessarily yes. customer things. Yeah, to it's no easier to, sure. to say no to business things. <laughs> well, and, and I think that's the point is we're not just talking about saying no to a particular customer. We have employees. We, we, have, we have customers. We have businesses that operate. We need to know which direction. Like AJ said, you know, you know as a shop owner, we want to get, you know, newly, newly we get, want to get involved in all things. And it's learning how to, how to, narrow your focus uh but but it's you're right it's easier to say no when you don't have a customer staring staring yes. your eyes yeah well just i, I was gonna just uh, speak to back to, to the covid uh uh well this whole pandemic and one thing that we did implement to try to get to to draw in more of those customers because we all had to adapt in some way or another during the pandemic. And one thing that we're still keeping as a result of the pandemic that we love doing, free pickup and delivery, right? You know, there's, uh, at this point, we, we will work on your schedule. If you're close enough, you're in that certain radius, we'll come pick your car up, bring it back, drop it off, 
So we, it's just one more item that we're implementing that we just, we love, customers love it. We just continue to create value. So on, the, so on these, uh, the, the pickup and delivery, is it buying you more time to schedule? Let me re rephrase that. So on the pickup and delivery, is this enabling you to schedule the jobs in to run your shop more efficiently? Yeah, certainly can. And also if they need a set of wheels, uh, also too, work has just changed, right? There's more people working from home now. So sometimes w when they needed a car to go back and forth to work every day, it's, it's a different environment than what we were dealing with over a year ago, which is really wild. But if they need a set of wheels, we just drop off a loaner, we pick their car up, we bring it back. So you can get pretty creative with it, but just having to adapt to what your customers are looking for is the way to go. Okay, cool. I think um, we do the same thing. We have 13 loaner cars and we do shuttle service. So we drop people off. We'll go to their house, pick up their car, leave their loaner or leave our loaner in the driveway for them. I have customers now that I haven't seen and I've, I've seen their car, but I haven't seen them for years. But it does, it absolutely lends itself to making it so when you are booked two weeks out to, um, they'll wait they'll wait to not be inconvenienced um, to get the oil changed, just to have somebody come pick up their car. You know, they will, they'll, they'll wait for that, and that's, that's really nice. It helps. When do you know about hiring employees? When you'd say, eh, I'm gonna just wait, I'm gonna hold off. I know when you've got a story about hiring employees, but you know, when you can't when you can't do it the way you're doing it now I guess you know when do you make that decision and stop saying no in that case maybe. yeah the hardest I think right now I'm down a tech and and you can that one tech um, bottom line wise is where my bread and I don't know where the icing on the cake is mm -hmm. that so right now I'm just just paying the bills and a little bit in the but once that other tech comes in, I've noticed that, you know, there's a number, there's a certain number and with having four techs, I can make that and put a lot of icing on the cake. Um, so right now we're down one and it's rough on all of us because everybody's do doing double duty. One thing I am absolutely blessed with is that my team knows what their job is. I have no problem doing other jobs and nobody complains. I have everybody um, on the bus in the proper seat and that took a long time <laughs> to get there. But we, um, uh, uh, hiring, that's, we've interviewed five or six techs and they're just not the right fit. They can they can do the work, they can, you know, they're, some of them are they're master techs, they've been doing this for years, you know, they're in their mid 40s, which is really great, so they can still lift up transmissions, things like that. But, you know, you just, I just, just talking to them for that hour, I know they're not gonna fit with my team. I know that it's gonna, go different. So saying no is really hard when you're like, oh, I could just get them in, put them on the end bay, and nobody can talk to them, and we'll just get some cars in and out. And it just, it doesn't work that way. It's um, not not for me. I don't, I, I we're very family oriented, mm -hmm. so I want to stay that way. So right now we're taking a hit a little bit, but it'll, you know, it'll be, it'll be fine. We'll find that right person. We just have to wait for it. it see, it'll so. pay it off, off in the long run, long run, because mm -hmm. I hired a legend in his own mind. Actually, I hired two of them. There's a lot of those oh, out yeah. there. <laughs> I hired a legend in his own mind. And unfortunately, I didn't catch it soon enough, and I lost two really good people because of it. And that's when I really wish I had said no, but I was like you. I had a need, and I was, I'm impatient. Okay, I'm, I'm an impatient person and I want to get it now. And I've learned the hard way. What I, I train you guys now is don't just hire somebody who can fog a mirror. They've got to fit your culture. If they don't fit your culture, what do we say? Nope. Nope. It takes you 10 <laughs> no. minutes to hire them and 10 years to fire them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, and AJ, with, with your growth, you're about to open a second store. You've already got a team in place. I find, find that fascinating. You know, the, the fact that here you are in the, one of the most popula populous regions of the country, high, high demand for technicians. And a, a few years back, 
for every one technician looking for a job across the U.S. there were 17 openings, but in the Northeast, like that, you know, from D.C. up to New York, one, there's there's for every one technician looking for a job, there were 30 openings. Oh wow! So how did you? And this is I want to I want to dig in on this one. How did you build a team without already having a second store? Yeah, well, I the the thing is all the best technicians already have jobs right uh so you know putting putting a an ad out there on indeed things like that that's good and that should be part of the recruitment process but um you need to you i I call it grassroots recruiting you need to figure out where those guys go to lunch you need to actively target uh currently happily employed technicians look you just want to have a beer with them you just want to sit down you just want a conversation that's all you're asking for so and 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 that is when it counts when you have that first uh, introduction of someone I, I when i get someone's contact info i'm like look I, i'm real bad at it let's, let's go out let's, let's, let's grab a beer after work let's just chat and uh and see where this conversation leads and a lot of times i just sell that vision and that culture so hard that they want in they really want to leave they thought they had it good but when i when i tell them and then also, I always followed it up the next day with an inter, with a, a shop tour. I give them a chance to, enter, to just uh, introduce them to the entire crew as it is. They see how we work. They see how busy we are. And they just, uh, it, it sells itself when they actually come and experience it. So again, it's really hard to find those that are actively looking, or I'm sorry, they're out there, but the ones that you really want to attract are the ones that already have a job. Right. And, and I think those ones who already have a job are already stable because if they don't have a job, there's a reason for it. So we've taken 15 months of, of struggle. Uh, we didn't have Apex last year. Mm-hmm. Didn't go to didn't go to Las Vegas. This year, all the excitement is starting to build back up again. People are planning to go to Las Vegas. They're planning to uh, to get back in uh, in in groups and start talking again. There's going to be a lot to look at. A lot of opportunity to get things, a lot of shiny objects out there. I'm talking particularly when it comes to equipment. Uh, I know there's other shiny objects in the shop owners in the shop owners world, but when do you say, and how do you say no to some of that? My, um, yeah, I, I, well, I can't wait. I've already booked my hotel. <laughs> I'm figuring out my flights tomorrow. I can't wait to be there. But um, my, uh, I have this, uh, it's like a funnel. My, uh, I have a friend who owns uh, a shop in Denver. And um, he, I was getting like super excited. I wanted to do fleet service and there's an Amazon service center opening up down the street. I'm like, oh my God, all those Amazon trucks. And I'm like, so excited. I'm like, there's gonna be money coming out my ears. (laughs) And um, I just, I was like, this is it. And he looked at me and he's like, what are you doing? What are you good at? I'm like, well, we're good at European cars. That's what we do. Saabs, Volvos, all that good stuff. And, and he's, he's like, don't. He's like, you're gonna spread yourself so thin, you're gonna start losing money. And you know, he's like, focus on what you're good at, keep that, keep it funneled down and keep it nice and tight. And, and it, it was, he basically t- said two sentences to me and that really changed how I, how I focus my shop and grow my business. I mean, it really, really changed it. it was. I, I think I think on my computer there's half of a finished brochure for fleet cars that I just never I'll, be, I'll never finish it I'll never do anything with it um, and it's and but that was probably one of the best pieces of advice because it was like I was like a kid in a candy store I was just you know I'll grab anything all those and, sprinter vans that are yeah, out there, right? I was like oh my gosh that'll fit in the bay go <laughs> you know? sounds like shiny objects <laughs> yes. yeah. AJ, that's you know that's a, a great point. You know, yeah, it'll fit in the bay. I could do it, but you know, how do you how do you say no when you're you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's true. You know, fl- fleet accounts uh, are good to work on to complement any business anyway. So the fact that Amazon's sitting right there, it still doesn't hurt to have a conversation. So it doesn't hurt to also have that conversation with your team. 
to see if that's something that they'd be attracted into working on. Also understanding how they pay, that's the biggest thing. Um, you know, uh, the one thing that I see that can happen with, with businesses that are really, they get really heavy with fleet accounts is the fact that, um, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've heard stories of, of shops closing because those fleet accounts never paid, you know, they, and they, they made a, they made a, a business go bankrupt. So you also never want to have a, a fleet account larger than 10% of your gross sales. Um, so, uh, and, and I've heard stories again with other fleet accounts, whether it be through CarMax or, um, you know, other warranty programs, things of that sort. Of course, they want to beat you down on labor rates. They want to bring their own parts. And again, those are now just, they're just, just easy no's. But like you said, if, if, if you're struggling to just keep the, the bays full, sometimes you're just saying yes all the time to get the bays full and just create activity. You're not creating any profit. So it's knowing again, when to say no, when to say yes understanding the difference, but also having those teachable moments from the past that determined how it's just easier to say no as a result uh, to uh, like, again, some of those, uh, those fleet accounts and warranty programs and things of that sort. So are you saying that it's, it's okay to say yes. And that in the middle, let's say you're, you're getting, just getting started. It's okay to say yes, as long, you know, as long as you're calling them out as you grow. You, 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 yeah, yeah you, definitely. Yeah, because you're taking in your non-prime customer because you got to you have a you guys both have prime customers. They match your perfect model, and you have you, you you're looking to fill it up with 100 percent of your prime customers. But you're you know you, you at that early stages you may not have all prime customers. Exactly. That's true. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it is. And, and every business is going to be different. You know, for example, there's a potential fourth shop that we just looked at. 50% of his business are fleet accounts. So that's the way he works. So yeah, if an Amazon moved down the street, he would be all over that. Um, so that, uh, it, again, it just depends. If, but yeah, I agree. If, if you're a European shop and that's, that's your, your core focus and your niche and that's what you're really good at, yeah, of course, focus on it. But yeah, those shiny objects of certain fleet accounts can definitely be uh, a distraction. Is it what other kind of shiny objects should you be wary of? Oh man, uh, you know, I, I think we've kind of alluded to a lot of them. Um, uh, everything from, uh, well, again, the, the rental Penske's, the the collision shop, the the car sales. Uh, you know, there there's. Uh, there's a lot of the, the hires too, like Wendy alluded to, you know, sometimes they, you just know they're not a good fit. It's, uh, you don't want to just like we were talking about just finding anyone that, uh, uh, you know, they might be able to produce all the a hundred hours a week. And again, look back at the teachable moments. I've worked next to guys that were that those prima donna individuals that knew that the world revolved around them. But like you said, you could potentially lose two to three other great employees or productive employees as a result of that one prima donna. So I, I, I was a, a victim of that. The last shop I worked at, there was a prima donna in that shop and I just did not look forward to coming to work every day. So those are the shiny objects that exist as really product, productive uh, technicians that could do really well for you, but just create enough chaos to where it's not worth it. So before we, before we wrap things up and we go over our final points, either you guys have any last pearls of wisdom you'd like to share with our audience aj uh gosh you know i really think if you're starting out sometimes and we've all been there right if, if this message is going out to a relatively new shop owner those no's occur because of previous experiences and, and you can take advice from a lot of us, but I just know personally, and, and I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I hadn't surrounded myself with other, pro, you know, professional shop owners that got me to where I'm at today. But still, you, you need to you need to have those failure experiences and those mistakes um, uh, that that you've that you've attacked head on to understand that now now we've created a, an SOP or a procedure to make sure that. We, we can we'll say no to certain jobs or certain customers or things of that sort so uh, i think it will take experience but of course always uh taking the 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 wisdom of of other shop owners that have been there done that definitely helps 
Yeah, I would. I totally agree with you, AJ. And um, mine would be uh, my advice would be to write down what your shop is and where you want your shop to go. And if that customer, that tool, that shiny object doesn't fit, don't try to make it fit. Just wait. It'll. It will come. Just have to be patient. Well, that's a perfect segue into my final points because. You know, using the power of no, it requires you to exercise self-control, define who you are. Don't tell your customer what you can't do. Tell them what you can do. Always be on the lookout for teachable moments. Saying no to business decisions is much easier than saying no to a customer. So your core focus will guide you towards when to say yes and when to say no. Thank you, Vic. It's a reminder that this episode was brought to you by Shop Boss, the leading shop management solution for independent auto repair shops. Built by a former shop owner, Shop Boss offers all of the cutting edge features and integrations you need to keep your shop on top from built in DVI and remote payments capabilities to a powerful business reporting dashboard. Try this cloud based solution free for 30 days by visiting shopboss.net slash podcast to learn more. I'd like to thank our guests today, A.J. Neely from Neely's Auto Service in Edgewater, Maryland, and Wendy Clausen from The Swedish Solution in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, both experts at customer satisfaction, reminding us that just because you can doesn't mean you should, and that no does not have to be a negative. If you've got questions, suggestions, or other thoughts, you can reach me at dkaufman at babcox.com. You can reach Vic at vic at shopownercoach.com. Again, on behalf of our guests and our sponsor, thanks for joining us. Look forward to talking to you again soon.